Powerplay Chess, brought to you in association with Kagi. It's the morning after the night before. Round four of the candidates is over. And I'm going to be taking a look at one of those games, Yanni Pomnishi against Vidit Gujarati. Before we get into the game, let's just remind ourselves of the standings going into round four. So we had three players sharing the lead. Gukesh, Nipomnishi, and Karawana all had two out of three. So let's look at this game. Nepo against Vidit. So uh, Vidit so far has uh, had an interesting tournament. He defeated Hikaru Nakamura. And then in the next next day, in round three, he was defeated by Pregnant Under. So could he kind of stabilize here? He has black in round four against Nepo. That's not an easy one. Let's see how Nepo gets on. Nepo, what an incredible record he has in candidates tournaments. Qualified through the last two. So he is one of my favorites going into the tournament, along with Caruana. Perhaps that's an easy call to make. Anyway, let's see what happened here. So we have a Spanish on the board. Okay, no big surprise. Nepo is a very you know, classical, straightforward player. And Vidic goes for the Berlin variation. Now, he doesn't have a huge amount of experience with this. He plays a whole variety of openings, but anyway, a solid he wants a solid day, clearly. And this is interesting. He doesn't go for d3. Nepo doesn't go for d3, which keeps the tension. Instead, he castles, allowing the so-called Berlin endgame, which arises after this. So black shouldn't take, the, take on d4. That opens up the e-file. But instead, black goes for knight d6. And the exchange on c6, d takes e5. The knight moves and queen takes queen and we have the Berlin endgame on the board so this was popularized by uh, Vladimir Kramnik in his world championship match in 2000 against Kasparov and since then it has been all the rage and it makes a lot of sense for black because black has the two bishops and particularly the light squared bishop which doesn't have an opponent um, it allows a kind of good blockade on these light squares, meaning it's not so easy for white to advance this pawn majority on the king side. This is white's advantage in the position, this pawn majority, but not so easy to get it going. So let's see what the players had in mind. So bishop d7, there are lots of ways to play this. h3 and h6 guarding the g5 square. So if I look at my database, there are around a thousand games in the database played from this position. That just shows you how popular this opening is, just from this specific position. And lots of moves played here. b3 is the most popular move. Um, but interestingly, very quickly, Nepo went for g4, so clearly well prepared. Played very quickly, and this has not been a very popular move in the position, although you know, in many ways it's logical to advance the, the kingside pawns. The problem when you play g4 very early is that often black will be able to get counterplay by advancing the pawn to h5, weakening this pawn and you know, bringing the rook on h8 into play. So this kind of raises the stakes a bit when you play pawn to g4. And Nepo followed up with very quickly with knight h2, so clearly prepared. Now, this has never been seen before and looks like a very strange move, moving the knight away from the center. Now, it does free the f-pawn, but do you really want to consign your knight to this odd square at the side of the board? I mean, looking at it from a very practical viewpoint, you could say, well, it does protect g4, which is means that h5 doesn't have quite the same effect if black wants counterplay there. I mean, the computers aren't very impressed by this move, frankly, which I think is very interesting. More on that in a second. 
So the idea of for white is clear, f4. You want to advance these pawns. And that, of course, that's the main strategic aim of white. So, yeah, sensible. So for that reason, Vidit plays g5. Okay, also sensible, it means that, I mean, white, I think, has to play f4 here. But white's pawns have been broken up. So, you know, this pawn duo, the E and F pawns, don't exist anymore. So it means that E6 is a stable square for the bishop. And there could potentially be some counterplay on G file, maybe H file as well. Then again, from White's viewpoint, you could say, well, you know, the, the F6 square is available perhaps for a, for a knight. Um, so both sides gain something from this exchange. So Bishop E6, a solid blockader. Knight e4, the knight swings round, and yes, that f6 square is available. So b6 covers c5 and also gives the king a little journey to uh, b, a safe square on b7. A little root, I should say. Um, yeah, I mean, th th this, of course, is one of black's difficulties in the Berlin. The king can't castle, so, you, you know, you have to castle by hand. You have to bring the king to safety in, in small steps. Knight f3. So the, the knight rejoins the action. Very logical. And c5 prevents the knight coming to d4 and you know perhaps black can use that square c6. Knight f6. Wonderful square for the knight. And the king just moves round to b7. And White improves the king as well. I think this is a very logical um, couple of steps for the king. If you advance the pawn to g4, these pawns are going to need protection. Um, and the king is relatively safe on g3. Sometimes, I mean, you don't really want it to be on a light square. <laughs> um, so, yeah, why not put it on g3 to support the g4 pawn? a5. So one of black's problems here is connecting the rooks. Um, you know, you would like to put a rook on the d-file, but if we just go back a move, to do that, you know, you've got to make a move like bishop g7, but then the knight hops back to h5, and you don't want to give up this bishop. Um, you know, that's, that's a permanent problem. So it's not really possible to move the bishop, which means you can't really connect the rooks. I mean, I suppose you, you could move the rook out through the middle, uh, but there's not much happening on the d-file at the moment. But Vidit decides to bring the, the rook on a8 into play via the queen side. It's an interesting idea. And, yeah, with the advance of this pawn, white has to decide, OK, do I, do I block with a4, or do I just ignore this pawn? You know, how far do I advance, let this pawn advance? I mean, I guess you could play a4. But in this case, when the knight switches over, you can see that these squares, b4 is potentially available. And if c3, well, that pawn could be vulnerable. So instead of that, we have a3 from Nepo. So it guards b4, allows the pawn to run on one square, but, well, also with a3, it takes the pawn away from the sight of the bishop. And rook d1, okay, rook in the middle, knight c6. I mean, I was surprised at Nepo's next move. c3, because it weakens, you know, these light square, the light square on b3 in particular. But it means he's covering d4. It's a very practical way to play. So it means he can now use that knight to go to h4 without fearing knight d4. Bishop b7, so finally the rooks are connected. And knight h4. So that knight might one day come to f5. It might also switch round to e3, which could be a very useful square covering these squares. And you can see, yeah, that's why he played c3. So h5. 
a vidit looking for counterplay. And well, if that pawn is taken, then you can see a check and the knight drops. So Nepo plays g5, and keeping the position relatively closed means that the, the king is safe, of course. And, you know, this pawn on h5 may be vulnerable. Right, Vidit gets his counterplay in motion, so he's looking to use the rook here. Rook e1, covering the e5 square, the e5 pawn, and that means that after rook b5, because the pawn is protected by the rook, the bishop drops back. And that looks neat. You know, you have to sort of ask yourself, you know, what exactly is that rook doing on b5? Well, Vidic kind of doubles down here and plays rook b3. It is looking... So the idea is to, to advance the b-pawn, b5, b4, which is reasonable, you know, getting counterplay using his 4-3 majority to, to break up those pawns. Um, the computers indicate that c4 is a better move. Positionally, that's rather ugly. It has to be said, it's not a very human move. And the reason is it blunts that bishop. However, it does open up the fifth rank for the rook. So attacking that pawn on e5. I think the thing is, this is it becomes fantastically complicated. You have to calculate some very sharp lines, starting with g6. Uh, this is really difficult. And the problem was, Vidit was down to something like a move a minute, perhaps even by this stage. So we're on move 26, so 14 moves left to get to the time control at move 40. And this is really difficult to calculate. There's all kinds of stuff going on, like this and g7, um, taking here, and bishop h6. So, you know, white holds onto this pawn and then has, you know, interesting possibilities to sack and move the rook down. I mean, black, according to the computer, is okay. At the board, with limited time, impossible to calculate. So at some point, you just have to use your judgment rather than calculate. And... Vidit thought, okay, I could lose by going down that route, too risky, and he went for rook b3, which is kind of a stable plan. But after g6, there's no doubt that white is really driving forward. So that has to be taken. Beautiful knights here that cover so many squares, and it means that that rook can't counterattack. Rook d8 played, uh, which, again, one of those moves that looks very reasonable, looking at the d3 square uh, to get some counterplay, h4 would have been a clever move, because if knight takes pawn, it's difficult for white to, to move forward quickly, um, because that pawn is vulnerable. So it just it's, it's a very interesting thought. But yeah, rook d8 played fairly quickly, an understandable move, but now Nepo is doing very well. For, well, first thing is, he manages to swipe that bishop. So it means that this bishop is, is looking good on c1, now there's no dark squared bishop, and knight h5. So that knight swipes the h-pawn and is looking to come back to push away the blockader on e6. So, you know, you can see that Nepo's play has been very logical. It's basically about driving forward his kingside pawn majority. Rook d3 check, but actually that doesn't have much effect. Rook f3, exchange. Well, it does at least take the h-pawn, um, but e6, so the blockader is gone, so past pawn should be pushed. And with the knight on e7, well, watch out, that can be expelled by the bishop. Uh, 
Vidit continues with his plan of gaining counterplay on the, on the queen side with b5. And bishop g5 drives the knight away. And e7. So this is looking quite serious. The thing about playing the bishop to g5 to support the pawn, push the knight away and support the pawn, is that if this is taken, then the bishop bounces round and hits c5, which, you know, after rook takes, bishop takes c5, that bishop will secure the pawn on a3 on an excellent square on c5. So there are good practical reasons for playing like this. Bishop d7 played. Now, in this case, there's no point in taking the piece. So it's, yeah, two, black has two pawns for the piece, but you can see that these pawns are vulnerable. That's a very different situation. The knight is a very strong piece here, actually. So white shouldn't grab the piece at the first opportunity. Actually, you have a think here. How would you play with white in this position? That gives me a chance to have a lovely drink of my Yorkshire tea early in the morning. Cheers, folks. So white play. You have a think. I'll have a drink. Cheers. Rook d1 is a very unpleasant move for black to face, particularly when you're running short of time. It's kind of a nice skewer. You can see, you know, that bishop has to cover the queen square. And, you know, nice tactics here. This is, this is extremely tricky for black. So, uh, Vidit played king c6. You could try bishop c6, but then king g3, and once again, if this is taken, then the bishop is in an excellent position. Knight b6 is possible, but then knight f4. This knight spins back into the game, and once again, there are all kinds of interesting threats here. Um, very unpleasant for black to meet. So let's go back. King c6 was played. And king e4. Excellent move. Hitting the knight. And this should be played. At this point, Vidit has to take. And take here. So the king has protected c5. There are still some chances for black to hold this position. It's certainly not easy, particularly once the knight joins the fray on the queen side. It's such a tricky piece. You, know, you can see a move like this will cause havoc in black's position. But this is the last chance for black. Instead, Vidit, this is move 37, played bishop e8. But this is losing by force. And Nepo, I tell you, once a chance is there, he is a brilliant calculator, and he seizes his the moment, seizes his chance. So bishop takes, and bishop c1, very clean move. Hitting the bishop, but also just protecting that pawn, just slows everything up, slows the, the queenside counterplay. Bishop g6 check, and king e5. So Vidit crashes on. But it's, it's too little too late. King f6. So it hits this one. So obviously if king takes rook, king takes and that rook is entombed on b3 and cannot get back to stop the pawn. There's also pawn takes pawn, but again king takes. This is, this is losing very simply actually. Pawn is going through. So bishop e8 played. This is move 41. Vidit has reached the time control, but he is utterly lost, and he knew that. Rook d8. Again, good calculation. If bishop h5, rook h8 is a very nice move. The rook hits the bishop, but also covers e8. 
and the king covers these two squares so that basically the bishop has run out of squares on the diagonal it needs to needs to come to uh, uh well what move would that be um yeah i i4 it needs needs an extra square on the diagonal um so rook d8 just played oh this is nice yeah if bishop d7 then you take and play king f7 and the pawn goes through game ended like this pawn takes pawn pawn takes pawn bishop d7 and now don't take here because in this case the rook will be able to come back but instead you play king f7 first and this rook is just stranded there's no way back and here vidit resigned um let me see what could happen rook takes c3 rook takes bishop if a check, then the king comes to e6. There's no check here because of the bishop. And yeah, the pawn is going through, basically. Well, what a very logical game from Nepo. Um, if we go back to the, the start of the Berlin endgame, you know, ultimately it's all about trying to convert this kingside pawn majority. And yeah, that e5 pawn came through right at the end. Um, and yeah, again, coming back to this position, this whole plan with g4, it's just all about pushing through the kingside pawns. It's very, very logical. Uh, yes, it, it's, it was a prepared idea, of course. But... As I said, the machines are not very impressed with White's idea. Of course, the, you know there were improvements all the way along for Black, but in human terms, this is simply a more difficult position for Black to play than White. Vidit consumed a lot of time trying to find the best response, whereas Nepo's play is really straightforward. He had one job in this position: push those kingside pawns through. And after the game, uh, Nepo's comment was about this position. It's roughly equal, but unpleasant for black. And I think that's a very telling comment. I think that's spot on. Roughly equal, but unpleasant. So this shows you, I think, really good preparation. You know, a lot of people are saying, oh, well, it's all about long engine lines. Actually, sometimes it is. But very often, it's about human beings recognising what is unpleasant for another human being to play. And of course, they're assisted by computers. But actually, it's still human wit that counts. And I would say brilliantly played by Nepo. He's deadly in these kind of positions with the initiative because he plays so quick he plays boldly and he plays quickly and at the end he basically calculated perfectly to finish off this position some people don't have the nerves to do that but he held his nerve all the way through right let's look at the standings after round four so Yanni Pomnishi now leads with three out of four he's on his own we have Gukesh and Caruana on two and a half. In the other games, well, Caruana was a little bit better against Gukesh. Couldn't force a win. Furuz a little bit better against Abasov. Again, couldn't force it through. Nakamura against Pragnananda, rather a tame draw. Nakamura with white really didn't try very much at all. So I'm not sure what's up with Nakamura, but he's he's not uh, making waves at the moment, but still a long way to go. By the way, do check out Svetlana Demchenko's uh, videos covering the Women's Candidates Tournament. That's hotting up very nicely. We have Tan Zhongyi in the lead with three out of four, followed by Alexandra Goryachkina, who has two and a half. Goryachkina is the favourite, in I think, um, but... Tan Zhongyi playing very well at the moment and leading. Thanks for watching.